Hello everyone. Welcome to our lightning talk. This is this will be the last session of the day. So we will have um, seven presentations, awesome presentations, um, and each presentation uh, will go for eight minutes, and then there will be two minutes for questions and answer. So please, everyone, all the pres presenters, be mindful of time because if you go over time, then the next person will lose um, their time. Um, so, and then also for all of you, if you want to ask question or make a comment about the presentations, please um, keep it really brief. All right, so the first um, presentation will be uh, Molly Swartz. Um, no, actually, each person, presentation, question and answer, and then second. All right, thank you all for coming out to our lightning talk to the power of seven. My name is Molly Schwartz. I'm an associate policy fellow at the Archie Institute and a Fulbright scholar in Finland right now. Where I'm working on this project with the Open Knowledge Finland chapter called My Data. So I'm here because it's a relatively new concept. We just came out with a white paper and we're in development for the technical side of things. So I'm really looking for other people who are working on similar work. We'd love to collaborate and we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, okay, um, so the project is called My Data, and it's looking for a more human-centric approach to how we organize our personal data. So as you all are well aware, right now our personal data online is scattered and collected and aggregated by all sorts of different players, um, by private companies, by governments, in different sectors, in the health sector, in transportation data, by telecoms, there's lots of facts about you that are out there in the data universe and being collected as metadata and as content. And so the question is, how do we keep innovating and using the benefits of having these big data aggregations and keep moving forward with open data programs that the government's running, but also have people take back more control over what's happening with their data and actually see the benefits of some of these innovations themselves. And I would say right now, we've almost been like Hercules trying to slay the Hydra and kind of going after one head and then moving on to the next. So maybe you deal with how digital intermediaries handle your data, or you deal with, you know, maybe just de-indexing something, or you deal with a specific sector. But we're actually looking at a new framework that comes up with an actionable, legal, and technical framework that kind of restructures the whole thing. So what are the principles of my data? Uh, the first thing, as I mentioned, is that they're human centric. So the idea is that you have the right to your data. So everything that's being collected, you actually have the possibility through a suite of APIs that ideally will kind of exist on your personal dashboard to recall that data back and download it and use it for your own purposes. You're in control. So there are more clear, accessible, and useful terms of service. So you see actually which portions of your personal data you're handing over to different bodies and you can control what you're sharing and who you're sharing it with. Um, and of course, this also respects rights to privacy. Uh, we're looking at usability of data. So uh, for example, right now, you actually do have legal rights to your personal data. You can contact your uh, mobile provider and you can ask for all the data they've collected on you. You'll probably get it in a like sheet in about 100 sheets of printed out paper. That's not very usable, especially if you want to do new things with it. So have them in open formats using APIs and using interoperable standards. Um, and also looking at a uh, more open business environment, giving individuals, consumers more choice over um, how they, giving them data portability. So the idea is that you can download your data if you want to, if you're using one bank and you want to choose your different banking service, you can take all the data that one bank has on you and then use it for a new service. Um, so this is our little graphic, kind of an example of how you are at the center of your personal data universe, and then you can choose to mash up different data sets as they come to you through interoperable APIs. And um, hopefully this will spur innovations that people actually create new applications and services that you can reapply your personal data to. Um, and I think this is a really crucial component of it, especially when you're looking at this idea of your identity online and who has control over it, uh, is that people are building their own rich profiles of data. Instead of companies or other organizations 
conducting implicit profiling and collecting different facts about you and then building out your profile from there, um, you're actually filling out your own profile. So you're saying, these are my preferences and this is who I am and these are the types of services that I would like targeted at me. And I actually think that provides a more rich data set and it lets people feel more like they're in control over what's going on. Um, as I mentioned, data portability is an important thing. Um, and so this, these aren't just pie in the sky dreams. Um, there's a whole white paper written on this that I've linked to on my last slide and you can find it. I tweeted it out this PowerPoint presentation. It's in Finnish, but we're translating it. Um, so a lot of the interoperable standards we're looking at already exist. And for people who are very nervous about privacy rights, and they see data aggregation as a problem no matter what. So even if you put the um, individual as the correlation point and the control point, they still see this as problematic because it's aggregating everything. There are already uh, examples of systems that are interoperable, but they're not centralized. So for example, when you use like a bank card, it's an interoperable system. You can use your bank card at any machine and it will work, right? But that doesn't mean that it's centralized. So these are some of the standards we're looking at. And that's my contact information. Please reach out if you have any ideas or concerns. Um, and there's a link to the white paper in Finnish. Thank you very much. sure that uh, if you're saying okay it's your data uh, that the kind of decisions that people make um, are actually uh, are actually same decisions in terms of sharing that data because we know that you only need very few information for, uh, for instance to be on anonymized and kind of data set. Right so the question of anonymity well one thing that um, we're very concerned about that we think is really problematic and how things work now is that oftentimes you're not notified if there's any changes in terms of service or if different companies are selling data sets to each other. So that's part of this is that the whole thing is much more transparent. Um, I feel like anonymity is less of a problem because you're choosing which data points people are accessing. So you're kind of voluntarily keeping it open. Well, my question is more, um, are people informed enough to know that if they would give their postal code and their age that they're actually telling who they are? I don't know if they're informed enough, but I guess they should be. Oh, well, how do you cater for that? I don't think that this is actually a solution that is uh, providing a system whereby people can be anonymous. That's, that's not the purpose. I, I think that anonymity is possible, but that's not. The idea is that all this data is already out there and being collected, so people should at least be able to benefit from it. Thank you very much. I thought we were, did, did, we, did we switch to order? No, we'll see who's next. Okay, that is us. Sorry, I think we switched okay. the order around. So hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Molly Land and I'm with the Human Rights Institute and the Law School at the University of Connecticut. Um, and uh, what, um, well, and let me just uh, take a minute and let Jay introduce himself. I'm Jay Aronson. I uh, founded and direct the Center for Human Rights Science at Carnegie Mellon, which uh, has the mission of bringing together uh, people with uh, technical skills, mostly uh, machine learning, 
computer science, computer vision, and statistics at Carnegie Mellon and elsewhere with people in the human rights community who have uh, big, big meaning, uh, profound, not big data, but big uh, computing challenges and uh, data analysis challenges that we need assistance with. Um, and on our behalf and on behalf of um, Enrique Preces of Benetech and Rights Lab, who wasn't able to be at the conference, um, we wanted to come today. And I want to emphasize at the outset that um, it is uh, uh, at this point still just an idea in formation. We have a website, but right now all we have there is um, pretty much a placeholder, um, uh, the, the placeholder for future work. Um, and so we wanted to present this idea to you to get your feedback um, on what you think about um, the concept um, and in particular to uh, hear your ideas about what we could do with this space um, that would be useful to you. So the Human Rights Technology Consortium uh, really arose out of a, a set of discussions that we had about how we could usefully partner up um, to support advocacy at the intersection of technology and human rights. And what we realized as part of those co uh, conversations was that we were each coming into the partnership with unique resources. Um, uh, both Jay and I are in academic environments, and Jay works with computer scientists. I work with uh, human rights lawyers and uh, human rights scholars. Um, and Enrique is uh, located in the advocacy and um, activist community. And so we thought that one of the things we might do is think about building bridges um, between each of those communities. Um, as a way of uh, sort of activating and connecting uh, the scientists and the lawyers and the scholars and academic institutions with the advocacy and activist uh, communities 